Dear online guests, dear students here present in the faced cell of the Law Faculty of Maastricht University, I welcome you all to this second lecture of the lecture series Strengthening EU Environmental Law, Legal Perspectives on Greening Europe. Our speaker today is Professor Fabrizio Fraccia from Bocconi University in Milan. He is invited because of his research and his writings on environmental duties. So the duty to protect the environment. Putting an emphasis on duties and exploring them for their value to protect the environment I think he makes a very important contribution to the discussion on the legal debate about, well, the trending theme, providing rights to nature. The lecture will be delivered online from Italy and it will last for about 45 minutes after which discussion will take place. The lecture will be recorded, the discussion not. Professor Fraccia, you have the floor with your lecture on the duty to protect the environment, which has the fabulous subtitle from anthropocentrism of a right to anthropocentrism as a duty towards future generations. So you can share your slides with us and take the floor to deliver your lecture. Thank you. Good afternoon Thank you for your uh, invitation. A special thanks to Marjane Peters that I had the pleasure to meet in uh, my university in Milan, in Bocconi. It's uh, a pleasure and an honor to be here and to, to, to meet so, so many people, even if uh, online or in online mode, uh, hoping that uh, soon we will have the opportunity to, to meet in person. So the, um, the subject and the topic is the duty to protect the environment, uh, this uh, uh, different uh, perspective. The, um, the, the thesis that uh, I would like to, to explain, uh, to, to suggest, uh, uh, is uh, aimed also in a provocative way at uh, debunking three myths by showing that uh, the environment is not right, as already mentioned, the second uh, uh, point is that the purpose of the regulation in the uh, branch, in this branch of law, environmental law, is not uh, to protect the environment itself, but uh, the human species. This is a, diff a second and uh, provocative uh, perspective. And uh, the third point, uh, we are talking about uh, a more uh, comprehensive sector of law, in my opinion, uh, the intergenerational re responsibility and relations, which includes environment, of course, but that uh, has a bigger area. Uh, of course, at the beginning, we have to consider the problem of the legal definition and the legal uh, uh, qualification of uh, environment. The qualification um, has to do with the attitude of the law towards uh, the environment in which uh, sense uh, is taken into account by the, the, legal, uh, the legal system. For example, the environment can be considered as an object of a sub subjective right. This is the most uh, common perspective. Uh, the definition instead uh, concerns the identification of what the law considers and regulates uh, uh, as environment. And the two aspects, uh, the legal definition, the legal qualification, are partly connected, given that, of course, uh, the law system protects the environment to a certain uh, extent, as long as uh, it has uh, certain characteristics uh, and uh, extensions. Uh, by the way, mm, to, to put it uh, simply, as for the definition, uh, and uh, in the in light of the analysis uh, of uh, uh, I, I would like to, to suggest, uh, considering some uh, uh, environmental acts uh, and the European legal sources, uh, such as the, uh, the Directive on Environmental Assessment and on uh, environmental uh, 
liability. I intend, and I will intend during my, my speech, the environment as a complex system which produce uh, ecosystem services, such, uh, for instance, the forest that, that uh, cleans the air, the landscapes, uh, offers spiritual uh, enrichment and the intellectual uh, recreation. Some fish uh, species can provide water purification and so on. A, a second uh, characteristics, uh, uh, characteristic is that environment as a legacy for the future. Uh, this, uh, generally speaking, is what I intend talking about environment in terms of uh, definition. The discussion on the legal qualification that I mentioned uh, uh, before is, in my opinion, more intricate. The most common qualification of environment is, and Marjan already uh, said that, uh, is that uh, environment is a subjective right. Uh, this uh, Idea. This uh, the thesis opens the way for a protection mechanism that uh, ensure a complete protection. Uh, in other words, uh, uh, subjective rights could be considered a sort of a bubble of immunity. You know? um, but uh, a, a close examination of this, uh, this idea, this postulation, often largely applied uh, uh, in the legal system and by courts, shows, in my opinion, some uh, inadequacies. At least, uh, remember it that, uh, technically speaking, the subjective rights, uh, I insist on that, uh, implies an absolute demand to live in a, a healthy environment. In Italy, for instance, that, that there is this uh, definition, uh, the um, right whose object is the uh, healthy environment. Uh, and in, in other words, an environment that is uh, beneficial to the owner of the rights and uh, in line with uh, his needs. Uh, in particular, all, also in Italy, but everywhere in the world, I would say, uh, according to many decisions of courts, the owner of the right uh, always wins. Uh, um, uh, but uh, this, uh, this idea that uh, makes the legal system very rigid uh, in uh, i think that could be uh, could could be considered in a critical way uh, in indeed against this uh, this uh, assumption i would like to move uh, this uh, critical arguments uh, some different uh, um, syndrome of paradoxes the first one uh, you can see on the left side, uh, the syndrome of the tsunami. My, my first point is that facing the attacks of the nature, uh, one cannot claim uh, any rights. Instead, uh, one is subject to the force of the, the nature and of uh, its uh, action. Mankind, uh, in fact, is often uh, attacked by the nature and uh, its elements. And therefore, by considering this perspective, the reference to the right in terms, I repeat, of claims of the subject towards the nature seems to be naive or, or unreal uh, because the nature obviously is not uh, obliged by the rules of the law. The law is a, a, a cultural uh, build the cultural construction of, of uh, human beings. The nature is not uh, um, bound by this, uh, this set of rules. Uh, I would I do say, this is my first point, uh, that man is dependent upon the laws of nature, the rules uh, of nature, uh, in the sense that very often is the attack the part, is the victim of this, the, the nature and uh, in, in its relationship uh, with the nature and the environment. Uh, it's the weak actor and subject to the nature, not the boss of, uh, of uh, the system. The second point uh, uh, below, the syndrome of the blank, blank page. My argument is if the subjective right where the, nomi the dominant legal situation protect protected by this branch of law, the rules uh, should somewhere express the, the relative protection. However, 
in my opinion, it's uh, impossible to find uh, such provision environmental regulation in this branch uh, of the law. M much more often or always, uh, the environment is taken into account by the legal rules, uh, by the environmental regulation for other uh, purpose or other perspective, confer some competencies, limiting the action of the citizens, preventing dangerous activities, uh, establishing sanction, punishment, and so on. Where is the right within this context? This is my question. Uh, of course, uh, there, there would be a relevant objection. Sometimes the legal system, considering as well, uh, or, or the case law, the jurisprudence uh, too, gives an example of subjective right, this uh, full protection, this bubble of immunity. Let's consider, for instance, the electromagnetic pollution or the other case of uh, pollution. But uh, I, my point is that in this case, and of course there are a lot of situations such that, the real ob object is not the environment, but health. Therefore, in other words, fortunately, we, there are many rights in our legal system, but uh, this right don't concern the environmental balance. I said that the environment uh, should be considered as a sort, sort of uh, eco, it's an ecosystem, there, therefore a balance uh, among different elements. The, the protection concerns the health not the environment in terms of uh, uh, system or ecosystem. The third point, of course, uh, there, there, there are some aspects in my argument that are not so, so clear, but I, I would like to provoke you also. The third point is the paradox or the syndrome of the crocodile, the poor crocodile that you can see there. If uh, my argument is if the purpose of environmental regulation were the protection of a healthy environment for mankind, then crocodiles, snakes, spiders, everything or every non-human element of the nature that poses at risk to the health of mankind should be excluded from the sphere of uh, this, the, this regulation. Uh, in other words, this uh, seems to be the right, subjective right perspective, a too narrow perspective, uh, perspective because it uh, excludes, it doesn't, doesn't consider other area of uh, protection. However, uh, it would be imprudent not to protect uh, these species also if they, they create a risk for human beings. On the other hand, generally the protection of the environment uh, does not mean uh, or always mean the protection of mankind's health, uh, such as in the protection of uh, wetlands uh, areas. So this is the third point, too narrow perspective if we consider or only the idea of subjective rights in terms of healthy environment uh, uh, for mankind. The other point in the following uh, picture, the paradox of uh, the indiscriminate impregnable stronghold. The, the right to a healthy environment, if this of course is the uh, content of the right, is basically the reflection of the legal perspective of anthropocentrism. Uh, the, the, the man, mankind, is understood as the world dominator, the dominus of the universe, uh, tra transforms itself into the sole owner of a right, who wins at all times and in all cases. And nonetheless, the environmental system requires instead balance flexibility uh, as required by the concept of uh, ecosystem, not uh, rigid, rigidity and uh, verticality. Uh, for instance, uh, um, given the variety of environmental issues, it seems impossible to imagine an identical position shared between all subjects. Uh, the management of uh, environmental problems should uh, uh, take place in a context with uh, 
uh, which allows uh, participation, dialogue, dialogue and the flexibility. The strong subjective rights seems to be too, too vertical, too rigid, not in line with the idea of a balance and of an ecosystem that deserve a different approach, also taking into account the different responsibilities. Linked and very close to, to the previous this, this remarks, so there is the other uh, paradox and the other syndromes, the problem of the tree which falls in the forest. Does the tree which falls in the forest produce noise, even if not perceived by human ear? This is the point. This uh, rhetorical question highlights uh, the risks and the limitations of anthropocentrism. Once again, we are talking about uh, anthropocentrism and uh, emphasize the tension between its uh, legal transposition, because the subjective rights is nothing else than the transposition within the legal branch of the anthropocentrism, tension between the, the, the transposition and environmental needs, this flexibility or that I mentioned before. Uh, the right could be referred only uh, to the juridical sphere, sphere of the person. Uh, and so the, the use of uh, this subjective right approach uh, constitutes a clear tribute to the anthropocentric view within the environment. Why many voices stress now uh, for transferring the accent, the accent from an anthropocentric to an ecocentric approach. Uh, the, the, the point he, here is that by using the subjective right approach, environmental phenomena may appear important only if crucial or relevant to mankind. And this is not uh, fair or enough, or, or even in juridical and legal terms. The problem of the sublime, hmm? This uh, is not a strictly legal argument, but uh, I think that the legal approach should be in line with the common feeling, let's say, uh, in this way. Uh, one can, can wonder when considering the Kantian sublime, the majesty of the mountain, the death of the, uh, the mighty ocean and so on, if uh, the mankind is the actual master, the dominus, the owner of this world. Uh, because uh, as, uh, as I said, uh, this is the deepest meaning of the subjective right, uh, at least considerably in a, a, a juridical uh, right perspective. I instead think that the common feeling of the human beings facing the environment, in particular the, the sublime, uh, and therefore uh, when they uh, are present to a natural event or are contemplating natural scenario, cannot be described in terms of claim to submit or to exploit the nature, such as the, the dominus of the universe. Rather, a, a, a different feeling uh, arises, a feeling of respect and uh, uh, of liability, thus confirming that uh, the proper approach to the problem cannot be found by emphasizing the right uh, of the man, uh, that's to say, I repeat again, is full and exclusive enjoyment of the nature. And it's interesting that uh, uh, again, considering the perspective of rights, and in order to offer protection to the non-human elements of the nature, such as the crocodile or any uh, elements that uh, is not a human, very often, and uh, also within the legal perspective, is said that these elements are the holder of rights. This uh, is a very sensitive issue and a critical point. Uh, it's a very common, the idea that we can talk about uh, rights of animals, rights of trees, uh, rights of the future generation, and so on. This is a, uh, an attempt to, to, to provide a protection 
of these elements that are not included within the area of the subjective rights of the human beings. Uh, but I, I, I don't uh, agree with this perspective, uh, although I, I'm well aware that is a critical point, because uh, uh, I just uh, forward and uh, introduce this element, there is the question of the standing. Who can stand for the nature? Who can stand for the future generation? I mean, the, the many which probably uh, put forward themselves as the more reliable protectors of guardians. I, my point is that the human factor kept away from the dimension of the holder of the rights, for instance, talking about uh, the right of a, a, a dog and so on. So we, we can imagine to keep away the dimension of the human, the, the, the human factor uh, relevance. But this factor comes up when the problem of the standing to sue uh, must be dealt deal with. When uh, exercising the, the right, uh, the need to identify a person, a human being that can claim the legal situation uh, appears uh, immediately. Um, we, we can, of course, uh, talk about uh, a, a sort of non-human factors right, but we have to use a, a sort of non-technical concept. And, um, I, I, would say, I would say a sort of a philosophical idea of right, not the right that I can trigger, that I can bring before a, a court to, to claim for a compensation, for instance, a different kind of protection. Um, on this uh, uh, basis, uh, um, I, 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 the, the idea of uh, the uh, environment as a subjective right seems to be uh, very difficult to be to be supported. But uh, the point is that uh, the legal system is inspired to the personalist principle. The, the mankind is placed at the center of the system. Uh, let's consider, for instance, the structure of many constitutions, the pivotal role is played by the, the, the person. Uh, and uh, so I think that uh, we cannot uh, suggest a definition of environment without considering the mankind and its central position in the legal system. Uh, the personalist orientation that is the core of the many constitution uh, obliged to, to, uh, to, to stay within this idea. Uh, and, and the anthropocentrism, despite the rhetoric of the rights of nature, uh, is the only reasonable and actually applicable interpretation in the law matters. Uh, uh, but uh, the point is that is not enough. The problem is, is, is due to the fact that anthropocentrism, when paired with the subjective rights, is absolutely inadequate. And so it's time to, to try to offer a different uh, solution to the problems of the legal natural environment by, uh, as I said, debunking the first myth that the environment is uh, a right. From this perspective, I would suggest to shelve for a moment the juridical analysis and to undertake a methodological deviation. Uh, I think that it's important to, to see what happened uh, and uh, to consider the perception of the environmental issue in other fields of uh, knowledge and science. In particular, in my opinion, it's important what happened within the philosophical field. Um, I, but by the way, uh, coming back to the point of the, the, the methodological approach, uh, uh, overcoming the rigid defense that separates uh, uh, the different disciplines, I, I think that uh, also legal scholars um, may get from other science, other fields, new uh, stimuli and topics. 
Uh, and uh, I think that it would be uh, narrow-minded to presume that lawyers can deal with environmental problems and their definition by confining themselves uh, to the ivory tower of law. We have to share uh, experiences, to share uh, perspective, uh, and to consider what uh, happened in other field, uh, what uh, other uh, scholars uh, uh, assumes that with respect to the environmental problems. And uh, to begin with, uh, uh, one may consider how mankind is currently rethinking its role in, uh, in relationship with the, the environment. Uh, this is important because uh, there was, uh, or, or we can we can look at a change in the last decades. Uh, this is the final act of a complex and fascinating story that we, of, of course, might sum up only in uh, its uh, silent stages. Um, but uh, I think that if we can un underline and identify the reason that have caused this change, uh, could offer useful cues in the legal analysis as well. At least this is my, my, the direction of my, my research. Uh, so let's start cons considering the original scenario, because at the beginning of the history of our culture, at least in the, in the Eastern, the, the, uh, the, the Western experience, uh, the history of uh, thought has been characterized generally by a sort of uh, anti-ecological attitude or an evidently anthropocentric one. This attitude, the very beginning of the history of our uh, culture, was due to, differ, to, to these several reasons, of course, and we, we cannot consider all the points, but uh, uh, I think that uh, a, a relevant uh, uh, influence on, on it has been produced by the religious idea of the human person that, uh, at least within the Bible, is considered as the center of the universe. This conception, uh, as I said, was uh, especially suggested by the Western Christian thought. The man, image of God, who embodies the reflection uh, the image of God within the universe. And uh, of course, uh, uh, from this point of view, uh, the, the man considers all the natural factors are stretched at his feet. By following this approach, it can immediately be noticed that environment is nothing else than an element or a sum of components submitted to the man and to his necessities. Hence, the nature is not relevant in itself. Therefore, he assumes that it was relevant to the place of mankind, its role as a reconstructor and the interpreter from the Bible. Mankind is at the center of the universe, which is at its service. Um, the nature is subjected uh, and uh, to the man, the man uh, is uh, the projection of, of God. As a matter of fact, uh, many indications in favor to the environment may, may, may be pointed out even within the religion they mention. Consider, for instance, the Eastern Christianism, which is more contemplative. Uh, the episode of the deluge, the flood, the, described by Genesis, where the man assumes a playing role of responsibility towards the nature or against uh, things of St. Francesco de Assisi in the, his high sensitivity with regard to the environment. Uh, therefore, a more uh, proper and uh, thorough the consideration on the uh, religious attitude uh, as for the environment uh, feel shows that the dimension of uh, its protection has uh, always been present and relevant. Consider, for instance, uh, the Laudato Si encyclical, uh, the recent uh, different attitude uh, in matter of environment, uh, in which uh, uh, the responsibility towards the common God is, uh, is stressed. But, uh, however, the influence of the original idea, the thesis that I outlined before, is very strong in our, in our culture. Um, 
But nowadays the situation is uh, is radically changed. Uh, the, the, we, we are uh, looking at or experiencing a decisive refocusing on ethics in particular with regard to environmental issues in the last decades. Uh, why that happened? The environment has been the object of a very different uh, movement, the environmental philosophy, the change occur occurred when with the publishing of some important works, some of them are indicated in the slides. Uh, such a path reflects the image of an ethics that has become adequately equipped to cope with environmental issues, in particular from the 60s, there have been stronger concerns over the future of the health, also due to uh, the technological development. Of course, these concerns have contributed to a, a renewed um, interest in such a, in such a, uh, issue, because of course uh, the, the the risk related to the human behavior is an important uh, aspect. Uh, and increased this the awareness of uh, environmental issue and uh, that uh, contributed to shift the focus from mankind to nature but i would like to stress another point because this is very common approach uh, a very well known uh, evolution i would like to stress the line of thought that prefers to find the um, the argument useful for the individuation of the feature of a moral and the area of what is morally relevant. How can be identified the area of the moral, what is morally relevant? What is morally relevant is no longer determined by applying absolute and predetermined values to the concrete case. Uh, such as, uh, for instance, the, the Kantian uh, perspective. You, know, you maybe you know that according to this perspective, if the provision, the, pers the, the precept is uh, not to lie, you must not lie to the thief who asked who you were, uh, you hid your your jewels. This was a very rigid approach in the sense that. Uh, um, the area of what is morally relevant could be identified by applying a sort of uh, absolute value that cannot be uh, challenged. Um, but this, uh, this line changed uh, and uh, uh, the point is that uh, according to the hermeneutics, the, the real, the relevant aspect is uh, to consider a sort of a dialogical perspective. Uh, this approach or attitude, I repeat, that gives value to the relationship between, because if it is a dialogue, there is the relationship between the subject and the other pole. Uh, the other, the other pole is not existing in its uh, objectivity but depend on the relationship with the subjective. This is basically the hermeneutic, no? And that could be applied in many different fields. Uh, for instance, generally speaking, the experience is interpretation uh, in the sense that it has to do with the dialogue. And this is quite clear, no problem about that. But uh, even science, even knowledge in general, have been involved uh, in this uh, idea uh, by rejecting the notion of truth as an objective datum that can be discovered in a neutral and totally detached way. Uh, many scholars uh, uh, acknowledge that the object changes according to who observe it. Let's consider the Einstein theory of uh, general relativity. This approach uh, move on and or or uh, makes make make us to consider that uh, the objectivity doesn't exist. So the hermeneutic uh, affected uh, or had to do with uh, experience in general, uh, science knowledge, but also and this is the uh, point that uh, I would like to. To, to consider the morality. From a moral point of view, the 
relation with the other, that means the respect for the other, the respect for the other ethics, uh, consider the consider moral the action that uh, take care for others uh, that consider or look after their needs you see another picture there the the great levinas uh, levinas says that uh, the human face orders and ordain us he calls the subject into giving and serving the other the face traces where god passes the fates uh, in its nudity signifies don't kill me, protect me. Of course, this is a, a religious approach, but this idea that it's the face of the other, it's the other that is in front of myself that requires the protection. Uh, this perspective has progressively widened in order to include, has been enlarged in order to include within the area of the uh, moral, the, what is morally relevant, to consider and to take into account uh, the other. Other might be the individual, the society, and finally, here is the our last point, the environment. The other can be the environment, and the observation uh, crucially allows to further enlarge the concept of horizon and uh, to, 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 to see the connection between morality and the, respective, the respect of the surrounding nature. This uh, evolution uh, has proved the moral relevance of the non-human elements, elements of the nature. That happened within the ethics. Uh, this evolution uh, of, overtake the qualification of nature as things dominated by, by mankind, uh, propose the, dialecti the dialectical and relational approach inspired by the duty of mankind. Uh, and the duty are particularly relevant in the context in which uh, mankind often plays the, the part of the aggressor, so the, the stronger part of the relation, or in which he the, is the weaker part and therefore must use precaution. In conclusion, environmental issues have take, taken on a central position within the current philosophical debate, thanks to the extension of the ethical duty. And uh, I would like to consider this point and uh, suggest that uh, in, in our little branch, uh, the, 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 uh, the legal system environment is the object of uh, a duty. Of course, a duty is uh, linked, uh, uh, related to solidarity, responsibility, and uh, so on. Um, in uh, simply put, uh, I, I would like to move from the anthropocentrism of right to the anthropocentrism of duty. No? Uh, and I think that the problem caused by the criticism exposed the pre previously to the argument of the right uh, could be resolved. Here you can see the, uh, the summary of the cr criticism that uh, I expressed, a tsunami, in case of environmental disaster, tsunami, earthquake and so on, human beings uh, are not the master of the nature. Uh, they are in the position of subjection towards nature, but that means responsibility, solidarity before, during, during and after the disaster, and not. Uh, and this, I think, that is the most adequate words or concept to describe the protection. Nature follows its own rules. Mankind can influence them only partially, but mankind uh, must live with an attitude of responsibility. Blank page. The positive legal, legal system is literally imbued with the regulation that impose duty, limits, sanction, sanction of the consequence of the breach of the duty. The crocodile, the protection of crocodile snakes is just justified. It's justified because we have the duty to protect the non-human beings too. Impregnable stronghold. Uh, the, the difference, for instance, between the kinds of the responsibility concerning different subjects uh, is in this way explained. Uh, 
uh, and the, the rigidity of the subjective right is uh, prevented. Uh, the perspective also offers the interpretation of the feeling that mankind experiences towards nature, the sublime. And uh, uh, the, the main idea is that uh, in order to protect the nature or the other elements, uh, to protect nature here and now uh, within the juridical system, it's better to use uh, this approach uh, uh, of duty, real binding duties of solidarity. We don't need to confer rights to the non-human elements uh, of uh, the nature to ensure them a real protection. And uh, there is another matter, uh, I'm going to, to conclude, uh, the principle of the subject at stake. Uh, of course, you know the, the main uh, environmental principle, but they reflect duties, not right. Those who pollute must pay. Damage must be mitigated the source. It's necessary to have a caution behavior. One must act in preemptive way. Uh, the impossibility to declare duties into rights, uh, uh, confirm this principle into rights, confirm the necessity to, to forsake the, the paradigm of rights. Uh, these uh, principles are a reflection of duty, but more in detail, they are the application of uh, the fundamental principle of environmental law. That, in my opinion, is sustainable development. Uh, you can see here the definition of the Commission Brundtland. Uh, this principle, once again, cannot be understood from the legal point of view as rights recognized to uh, people currently living. This is a, a duty, this is a responsibility, define the responsibility of the present generation towards the future generation. So that was the first point. The second point, very briefly, is that uh, if the basis of duty stands firm, the another different element appears. The, if we consider the sustainable development, the sustainability, which is the pivot uh, of the, this branch of law, it appears the ultimate, ultimate purpose of environmental regulation is not the protection of nature per se, but the, the, the idea is to protect mankind's possibility of survival. In other words, Mm, they, I, I stand, I, I remain within this anthropocentric attitude. Uh, and the regulation, in my opinion, is aimed at, at uh, protecting the environment. Of course, I am well aware that uh, it may, might appear astonishing and outraging. Of, however, would it really be possible to imagine mankind accepting to safeguard the non-human spaces to the detriment of its uh, own survival. In uh, the case where there will be resources only for a species, do you really think that human beings will accept to be extinguished in favor to another species? But of course, uh, mankind is well aware that in order to ensure the survival of its own species, the environment, the ecosystem, but must be safeguarded. But the scope of environmental law cannot uh, uh, be traced within the can, can be traced within the framework of obligation and solidarity. Um, I repeat that uh, this idea, according to which the environmental regulation is a selfish branch of law, is highly questionable and uh, difficult to accept. The last point. Uh, uh, I would suggest uh, to detach sustainability, sustainable development for the environment by linking sustainability to a number of other sectors. My idea is that environmental protection is simply a part, uh, a sort of tip of the iceberg, of a larger area or branch of law. It's the most example of uh, this area, but it's not uh, the only one. The, the fundamental uh, a cornerstone of this branch is the principle of sustainability, which expresses, as I said, the kind of intergenerational responsibility, duty instead of right. Uh, I, I think that this uh, new sector of law uh, could uh, be applied where intergenerational responsibility arises, and then these are 
the main area. Of course, are the great problems of uh, the modernity. The, uh, the, the plausibility of this proposal, I repeat, the progressive emergence of an autonomous set of law having as its object the responsibility and the intergenerational responsibility uh, is supported by different sets of consideration. First of all, all this uh, area, all these crises have similar uh, characters. Let's consider, for instance, climate change, immigration, financial crisis, crisis, energy crisis. They are global. Therefore, the first point is the global, globality, or in any case, no reducibility of problems on the scale of a single state. Uh, the wise, widespread nature of the damage, the plurality of causes, the spatial and, and temporal disconnection between cause and effect, the information asymmetries, the relevance of technological innovation, the difficulty in identifying the most appropriate decision-making center, uh, the need to organize differentiated responses, uh, the impact on public budget and public administration, on justice and equity. Due to the presence of uh, common characteristics, I assume that they may, might be considered as a part of the same branch of law. And we need a common theoretical filter from a scientific point of view. Another uh, element, the tendency to broaden the concept of sustainable development. You can see, for instance, the, the 17 sustainable development goals. They don't only concern the environment. The environment is very important, of course, but uh, they, uh, they, they cover different dimensions. Uh, that uh, uh, is, is a clear, expansive attitude. In many constitutions, uh, sustainability now uh, has been enlarged as far as including the public debts, any uh, in, in aspect where there is intergenerational responsibility. And the a broadening of the application spectrum, the principle, in my opinion, justified the attempt to unify the investigation perspective. Not only, intergenerational problems often arise simultaneously, are linked. For instance, uh, the intertwining of climate change and immigration is very evident. Or they, these problems are related to each other in terms of uh, cause and effect. The war crisis generates environmental and energy consequences. The attempts uh, to overcome the energy crisis produce environmental tension in uh, or significant food crisis. Consider, for instance, a comparison between COVID pandemic, a pandemic in the past, such as the Black Death in the 14th century. is impressive because, because both periods are characterized by pandemics, climate change, maybe you remember that the Little Ice Age was a period of cooling in that area, population growth, financial crisis, moral crisis. The, in that period, the Avignon Papacy, uh, when the Roman Catholic Papal residence reliquated the Avignon, the 100 years war. So there are very common uh, characteristics that uh, are impressive. Another common element is that very often these problems or their effects appear unpredictable. Economic crisis, financial crisis, health crisis, climate change, energy crisis. In reality, we often realize exposed that a more responsible choices in the past could have prefigured them. Uh, for instance, the earthquake. The other point, the management uh, should take place at a super national level, but is a, a, a clear um, local problems, kind of problems. Uh, so, it, as I said, the environmental protection to which the characteristic about mentioned are usually connected is the, only the tip of the iceberg. The other question, the first step of my uh, research in the future, uh, are, uh, for instance, uh, how to define uh, the area, what operational consequences can be derived from the general legal principle. So, so very quickly uh, to, to conclude, um, I, I would say that, uh, first of all, uh, I said that these are pro problems of the modernity. I would like to, to focus this point uh, also to, I, I, I am interested to know what do you think about that. Uh, because it could be objected that uh, uh, 
they uh, wars uh, uh, crises uh, are uh, so recurrent in the history and they are not a prerogative of the modernity but uh, of course the the objection is correct in principle but uh, does it does not take uh, into due account two facts first thanks to technology today there is a greater possibility for men to aggravate, aggravate and speed up the crisis. This uh, character lacked at least with the same intensity in the past. And above all, on the other hand, the environmental crisis, the paradigmatic example of the intergenerational problem, shows that uh, unlike in the past, today we no longer have time. This is the point. We are as drivers of a Ferrari that runs very often, sorry, very fast into a wall. And uh, I is citing Heidegger here, just as the existence, the perspective of the being for the death of Heidegger, the existence is authentic only when it's uh, traversed by the anguish deriving from becoming aware of our finitude. Also in the sector of law, this anguish brings out the essential need to identify the real intergenerational problems and to set principles and rules that uh, embody the authentic uh, need to take care of those who are weak or to protect ourselves from those who are strong. Uh, this that gives reason from the fact that the environment remains the driving factor of this new branch of law, it, because it remembers us the tragic incumbency of the modernity, deciding for death. The strength of the environmental issue forges the characteristic of the new law of intergenerational choices. Uh, and the law tends to extend uh, the, the scheme already uh, used in the, the new new field. But this is the second or a second important uh, consequence to identify the border of the intergenerational problems. My point is that uh, when we are not placed on the, that intergenerational level of responsibility, when uh, it doesn't come to these kind of problems, uh, when uh, uh, the, the option don't have a real intergenerational death, let us live in peace, uh, the main claim, avoiding the continuous, for example, functionalization of human action that uh, some, some, somewhere, somewhere transpired from a sort of rhetorical insistence of the environment. Uh, the, this theory, anyway, the theory that today I offer to your consideration seems to, to be able to describe and explain the characteristic of environment and intergenerational problems. The last step, but I won't move on this point, is to identify some operational consequences, not only to describe, we can, you can derive some real specific uh, rule to be applied for the solution of intergenerational problems. That maybe uh, could be the, the topic of the future, the future speech, uh, but there are some, some very important elements, for instance, in the jurisprudence of constitutional courts. Uh, but uh, since I mentioned duty and responsibility, I think that uh, now it's my duty to stop not before thanking you for your time and your attention. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Fabricio. Um, uh, this was really a great lab, uh, lecture, shifting the perspective from legal rights uh, for nature to the duty, the duty of uh, each individual to protect the environment. And um, yeah, uh, I, I really uh, uh, would like to thank you for this um, yeah, very fundamental discussion. Thank you very much. You're welcome. That means that the recording will now be stopped.